Welcome to The Mixtape with Scott, a podcast that dives into an oral history of economics, exploring topics from the last 50 years. From the students of Gary Becker to contemporary issues like economists and tech, I cover subjects that I personally find fascinating. But this is also a platform to uncover the personal stories of real economists as they walk us through their lives and their work. I'm your host, Scott Cunningham. This week, I had the immense pleasure of interviewing one of my favorite economists and econometricians working today, Alberto Abadie, Professor of Economics at MIT. Alberto is a prominent econometrician who has written several ma major works in econometrics, including the synthetic control method, hailed as one of the most important innovations of causal inference in the last two decades. He'll be hosting a workshop on mixtape sessions April 27th and 28th from 6 to 9 p.m. on synthetic control and clustering. For anyone interested, just shoot me an email and I can give you some details about it. Thank you for tuning in again, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. Also, check out my Substack, Scott's Substack, where I semi-regularly post what I call explainers about econometrics. Well, it's a pleasure to have uh, on the show one of my favorite people I've uh, followed for a long, long time and learned a lot from, Dr. Alberto Abadi. Thanks for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. It's great to see you. Can you, for the sake of the listener, uh, could you tell us your name, your job title, and, and who pays your bills? Uh, my name is Alberto Badi, and I, I work at the MITA in faculty here. And uh, yes, that's the way I pay my bill. <laughs> you make MIT pay it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So before we get started, uh, what's something that you love doing outside of your academic work? And why do you think you like it? Oh, I like to do all kinds of things with my kids and my family more generally, my wife and my kids. Um, we in the in the winter we go skiing and uh, and we enjoy it very much because um, you know it's a way to be active in in New England that otherwise you're going to be in the winter like uh, uh, you know at home. And so we are outside all the time. We go hiking, uh, we visit places, we, we travel with the kids, and uh, that's that, that I enjoy very much. Oh, yeah. So, where did you say you go? Where do you go skiing? We go to New Hampshire. Oh, New Hampshire? Okay. Every, every Saturday, the kids are in a racing program there. And uh, so, it's a credible commitment to every Saturday. Wake up very early in the morning and, uh, and go there and, oh. uh, you know, have a good time outside. I don't know if you remember. That's funny you say that. I don't know if you remember one time we were at NBER and we were sitting by each other and you told me that you had a uh, bumper sticker on your car that said, it's my job to embarrass my children. Yes, but it, it was not my bumper sticker. My, a neighbor of mine has that bumper oh, sticker. A neighbor of yours had it. Okay. That's the story. Yeah, that's the story. <laughs> okay. It's a full-time job, full job to embarrass my kids. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. That's part of the perks. Um, yeah. <laughs> can you... Uh, and and I do it. I, I do that quite effectively. I can, <laughs> you know, if my daughter will tell you that. <laughs> that's right. They don't realize it. Like, uh, you get paid. There's lots of ways we get paid to be uh, parents that they don't, they don't know about. That's one of them. Um, mm -hmm. okay. So can you tell me about growing up in Spain and the Basque region? What was it like and what were some of your best memories? Um, uh, you know, I have, like, I guess, I don't know, uh, pretty, pretty regular childhood. The only thing that was, um, um, you know, unusual about that is that they, at the time I was a, a kid, it was the Spanish transition. So there was a lot of conflicts and demonstrations. And, uh, and so on, like even like uh, in the area where we were living, but that was part of life. It was not uh, something like very unusual to me because I have lived with that. <laughs> and, right. uh, you know, after that, you know, like things became, became much, much quieter. But, uh, you know, like I have a group of friends, like uh, we have a lot of fun. We have fun in school. And um, yes, with like a pretty regular childhood, I think. Yeah. Wait, so did you say that the, you had as a child experienced some of the violence? Is that what you said? We experienced like a, not a, a you know, like a, a re real violence against us, but it was very, very close to us. Uh, uh, I mean, that's... you could see it from the window in your, your place. Like there was like a, you know, like a, a demonstrations in the streets and, a, and some conflict and, and so on. Who got caught up in that? Did your, did your, was that, was there a lot of collateral damage of that, of those protests? To, to some people, but you know, like a, uh, you know, at some point, as I said uh, before, like things become uh, much quieter, like, uh, and, uh, you know, like uh, after the Spanish transition, like, uh, 
Um, you know, there was still a terrorist conflict in the Basque Country, as you know, mm -hmm. and uh, but it then, uh, you know, like um, uh, luckily uh, for everybody, like that also finished, like uh, that's that is also done, and now things are things are much much nicer. I see. Okay, so. Um, how do you think your childhood and your early life experiences influenced your, your, any of your later interests? And in, you mean in terms of research? Mm, maybe. Uh, okay. That's a, like a very, uh, you know, like a open question. Let me think about it. Uh, so something that I did a lot as a, as a, as a kid was a, I was a very avid reader, like a, and there were like a lot of books uh, at my place in my place and and uh, and uh, you know like uh, i only have to reach for one of those books and I start reading and uh, this is something that i did a lot mm. and um, and i you know like i i you know as any like a avid reader you go through like several phases and like uh, and uh, you know like you start like a you know i started like reading like a uh, mainly literature for kids but a uh, Pretty soon I ran out of the those like uh, those books, mm -hmm. and uh, you know there were like other books in the house, and I started uh, reading other things, and uh, and much of them like um, uh, you know like they have like a relatively large like relatively like a um, you know like a good social content, like uh, there were like mm -hmm. a many you know like a books about you know like in uh, you know Spanish and Latin American literature, and uh, you know that kind of uh, perhaps in the you know like uh, the make the future me like a care quite a lot about a, mm. you know um social science and societal uh, issues yeah and uh, and um so this is i don't know like a thinking right now like very fast this is like perhaps one one link that i can make mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. yeah so that was kind of, so what like was it like science fiction kind of thinking about the society or something like that well, science fi science fiction was one. Like, uh, so for example, like uh, I read a lot of uh, books and um, magic realism. I think yeah. you're as, you're you're like English major, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So you, Gabriel so you know Garcia Marquez. Uh, yeah, Garcia Marquez, Cortázar, and uh, and and so on. And again, there there was a lot of uh, like uh, societal issues there, like uh, like in the narrative. But yeah. you are right that science fiction also play a role. Like I uh, remember reading like. Uh, Foundation by Asimov, like 1984, like um, a Brave New World. And there is a little bit of, uh, you know, like a historical determinism there, right? Yeah. And uh, But that also makes you think, like, if the, if the society is like a big machine, like, we can we can do something with big machine and, like, make things right. better. Right. And uh, so, I, you know, like, it, that also play a role, I think, like, science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Extent. Well, what about high school? What was it like there? High school, I mean, high school was a, like a really happy uh, phase in, in my life. Really, like I, I have a lot of friends there that I, uh, you know, I still see from time to time and, um, and um, or some of them at least. And, uh, and I was not super interested in academics, I have to say. I, I, you know, I was doing other things. I was like, a, you know, I was drawing comics at the time, like as I said, like, a, like a reading a lot. Uh, we have a group of people who did like photography and film, and mm. uh, you know I was more interested in artistic uh, projects than in oh that's interesting in, than in say, academia. Did you say drawing comics? Yes. Oh wow, huh? Uh, we did that. We have a little bit of a uh, you know like a fan scene, like a you know like a, uh, a magazine that we make like a, with a photocopier. Really? And, uh, like and sell in the streets. Yes. Oh wow, wow! So you were a good artist. I was an okay artist, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, good enough to uh, uh, to keep up with my friends who were probably more talented than me. Wow, that's neat. What kind of stuff were you drawing? Was it superheroes? No, uh, it was not a. It was not only that. Perhaps at the very beginning, but I, you know, I don't think I remember. We were like very much influenced by a kind of a French um, comics, like a Moebius and. Bilal, although Bilal, I'm not sure if he's French or Belgian. Or yeah. Belgian. I don't remember. But uh, you yeah. know, like uh, uh, this type of uh, this type of comics, we were very influenced in my my high school. Many people, and we were we were doing that. So, were you were you naturally good at mathematics though in high school? I think I was good because so something that I 
you know, like I remember doing, like I, I, I don't really spend in, you know, like quite a lot of time, like, a, uh, you know, like studying on, on, you know, working hard in, a, in my, uh, you know, homework or something like that. But, uh, you know, I was able to do it, you know, with a minimal effort in a quite effective way. Mm. So like, uh, uh, I, 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 I never fail a course or anything like that, but I was not also like, a, I was not trying to get the best possible grade. My, my, uh, my objective function, so like is, you know, pass this course with a okay or good uh, grades, but you know, at the minimum effort so I can do all the things. Mm. Uh, that was a, that was the, the way. So it, it was, was kind of uh, like, it was kind of on the side. It wasn't really like what you were mainly interested in. Not at the time. At the very end of my high school, yes, but not a not the first years of high school. Oh, so towards the uh, end. Yeah, I remember I have a um, biology teacher like uh, Gloria, who like I I gave us a test and I passed the test, and she came back to me and I and she told me you passed the test, but I'm going to fail you, and I say well, like what what is going on? Like what what is this about? And say so, like uh, I know that you can do much better and you are just not putting enough effort. So unless, unless you ace this test, test, I'm going to keep failing you. And I thought at the time that was like terribly unfair. Yeah. But then like kind of, a, you know, I learned something from it. Huh. And I still remember that. That's a very attentive teacher that yeah. knows, knows what your potential is. Wow. <laughs> so where do you end up going to college? I went to college uh, like a, a literally five minutes away from where I uh, used to live. I went to the University of Basque Country mm -hmm. in in Spain. I, I guess like as in most of Europe, you go directly to a department, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so like um, the Department of Economics was there, and I was I was I, I was there in the Department of Economics as an undergrad. How do you find economics? So there is a story about that, in fact, that uh, I, I tell from time to time because, uh, uh, you know, it's a uh, slightly funny. In fact, I, my first project was to do physics. So I mm. decided I was interested in how the world uh, works and and uh, and I decided that, you know, I wanted to study physics. So I went to my father and uh, I told him that, uh, you know, this is my plan. I'm going to study physics. And he told me, like, uh, no way, you're not doing this because the only... The only thing you can do when you study physics is become a college professor. Right. So I studied economics and I became a college professor. College professor. <laughs> so that's, that's, <laughs> that's the way it works. You'll, you'll, you'll do a comp, you'll compromise. You'll not do physics, but you'll still be a college professor. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. I guess that, that is what happened. <laughs> Wait, so he liked, he, your dad liked economics. Well, in fact, my 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 father was a tailor. He didn't have a lot of a, a you know like a academic education, mm -hmm. and I. But he thought that uh, at the time he thought in his gut uh, he his gut feeling is that uh, physics was something probably very interesting, but uh, probably something that was not very practical. Right. Okay. And he wanted me to study something very practical mm. and uh, applicable. So he didn't know so much about economics, but my. Um, my older one of my older brothers like work in a financial institution so he went to him and asked him like uh, what do you think about alberto studying economics and uh, my brother gave me gave me his blessings <laughs> and so i was i was able to do that that's great so do you what was your first experience with economics where you really liked it no i really like economics it's not that i didn't like it i i, I think uh, you know at the, i was kind of in between you know, like physics and economics, uh, you know, like from the beginning, I, I kind of decided for physics, but then I went for it to economics. But I, I kind of, as I said before, I was uh, like interested in how, you know, the society works. Yeah. If this is this true that it's a big machine in some way. I want to know how this machine works. So you kind of, to, uh, you yeah. saw that, you saw that potential of economics pretty quickly as being like a big theory of the machine of society. Yes, but it was, it was not an informed, opinion i mean like uh, uh, we study history and uh, you know within history we study a little bit of economics in high school mm. but to me e economics was a big mystery about what what economics is about yeah. uh you know like uh, as you know like physics chemistry like mathematics i knew i knew that that you know like uh, i have been exposed to much less to much less to economics right but you know i was interested yeah 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 was there one professor there that had a big impression on you there were 
two professors uh, at the, the in my undergrad that has uh, like a big influence on, on me. One um, uh, was uh, Federico Grafe, who was a theorist, who uh, put me in this uh, seminar in which uh, we will discuss papers. And um, and um, it was mainly theory papers. Mm. And um, But uh, he also told me like uh, after two years, like at that time, like uh, economics was five years. Mm. And after two years, you will go into like a speciality mm. uh, for year three, four and five. And there was this one that was called like a mathematical economics and quantitative methods. Mm. And uh, it, it didn't have like a lot of openings, like uh, around 20 or something like that. And uh, my class, we were 22. And I think it was the the, the largest number mm. uh, because there were like 22 terminals in the computer room. But anyway, oh. he told me like, hey, that's, you know, that's that's the way like uh, you should go. And, and um and um, you know, I think that is the you know the type of specialization that would be best for you. So we try. I tried that, and I really, really love it. Like, and there, there was there was another professor, Fernando Tuzel, who was a statistician, mm. uh, who you know, like, uh, basically, we were studying for his course like ninety percent of the time, mm. and you know, at the very end, like, we were like, uh, you know, the day or two before the some for the other uh, you know subjects, we will study that. Uh, you know, but it was a great experience. He was super passionate about uh, statistics and data analysis, and and how to use that to to solve problems. Yeah. And uh, you know, like uh, we we really like uh, we were like a you know small class, like uh, good friends, and um, and really enjoying uh, the material that they. Uh, well, what about Doctor Gardezbal? What about Doctor Doctor Gardezbal? Did you have him as an undergrad? No, in fact, I I. <sighs> You know, this is a little bit uh, embarrassing, but I, I'm not sure. Probably he was uh, doing his PhD in uh, in UPenn at the time, oh. or perhaps at the very end he was there. But we didn't interact when I was uh, when I was in college. Oh, uh, I started interacting with interacting with him after I finished my PhD here in oh. the US. Oh, okay. I want. All right. I'll, I'll save that for later. Okay. Great. So did you, could you start to feel in college this pull towards econometrics? Because you said statistics. Were you already noticing uh, that you wanted to do that? Yes, I mean, there was a lot of econometrics in that, uh, in uh, you know, in the courses that, uh, that I took. But you asked me about a, a particular professor who impacted me and uh, and he considers himself an, an statistician, although he does a lot of econometrics. Oh, okay. And, but we did, we study we study a lot of econometrics, of course. And did did you could um, you feel that you were interested in this a lot? Did, oh yeah, very much. You noticed very it, much, yeah. Well, yeah. well, so you were interested in the big pictures of of how society is run, and I could imagine you then saying, "I'm going to become a a macro economist." How how does that how is that bit that interest in uh, those large pictures of society start to connect you to econometrics? So, like I thought, I I had this. Um, I guess connection with uh, you know like uh, going a little bit uh, uh, beyond models, but also with the help of models. But you know apply like a uh, you know like a uh, you know look at the data and uh, you know apply data analysis and see how we can you know like improve um, uh, things. Like uh, I was interested in education, I was interested in labor, mm -hmm. and uh, you know this. Uh, these are areas where you know, like, uh, you know, that they they are very much in touch with econometrics, right? Right. Uh, right. At least the certain the certain type of econometrics that I was uh, I was learning there, mm. and uh, you know that's what uh, that was uh, where where my interest was at the time. Right. Right. Yeah. Sure. So you graduate. Do you go mm -hmm. immediately to MIT? No. What do you I do? Go to the, I go to the military first. Oh, you go to the military Be because the um, at the time like a uh, military service is compulsory in Spain for males, uh -huh. and and um, and I go there. I go to the military, oh, and yeah. after the military, I go to uh, to Zenfi in Madrid, uh, um, and I and I uh, you know I studied there for two years. Oh, okay. So two two years total or three? Well, uh, the military was one year. One year. Uh, I was in the in the navy for one year. And then, like two years in in Madrid. Oh, okay, okay. So, are you still thinking along this time? At the very beginning, are you thinking school? I'm done with school, or are you thinking, you know, I kind of might be interested in doing more? No, in fact, like uh, the reason why 
I went directly to the military at the time that when I finished um, when I finished uh, college because I wanted to go, uh, you know, abroad to uh, to study a PhD. Oh, you like did. otherwise, I could, uh, you know, I could have deferred or something like that. But uh, you know, I wanted to be done with that and and you know, like and and be able to you know be free to go and study a PhD. Mm. Although you know, like at the you know by the end of my military service, I kind of a uh, became, I guess, a little bit disorganized, and I was uh, also not totally sure uh, by the time if I wanted to do a PhD, I have to to think about academia a little bit more. Yeah. And you know, Tenfi was like a great institution in like in Madrid, and uh, you know, I have heard very good things uh, about about that, so I applied there, mm. and I got admitted, and I went there for a couple of years. No, wait, what's the name of it again? I want to catch if I understood. That. It's, it's called Tenfi. It's the Centro de Estudios Monetarios y Financieros. It's a, it's an, um, you know, like um, educational it... institution that is a, it depends, um, um, you know, a little bit of what's created by the Bank of Spain. Is it the and, one that uh, says C three? No, that's Carlos III. That's a university. Oh, okay, okay. I'm going to be at this, C3 in a, this, in a couple of months. This one doesn't have undergrads. This is where, uh, you know, like Manuel Alano and oh. Enrique Santana are and, and so on. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, great. So um, so then you graduate. Are you still taking a lot of econometrics at, at your master? It's a master's program? It's a master's program. Yeah. So what do you what do you gain? Well, it's a master uh, program. Is is what you will translate it as a master program. The time like this, such a thing as master in a, in economics does not exist in Spain. But you know, mm -hmm. it's called diploma there. But uh, you will understand it here as a master program. I see. Okay. Okay. So what does that do for you? How how do you change during that period of time? Well, like you think, I became I became like a, a or. A, well, I became a state center kind of in the same type of uh, goals. I still wanted to do like econometrics and yeah. and uh, also like uh, very much like uh, I was interested in uh, in labor. My mm -hmm. my my master thesis there was like a combination of both. I I learned from uh, you know like uh, amazing faculty there like. Uh, uh, and something that I, uh, I understand there is that, uh, you know, if you want to, you know, I learned there what it takes to do excellent research in in in, in economics and the amount of commitment mm. uh, that you have to that you have to put on the table. Right. Uh, they, they were like great role, role models for me. Right, 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 right. So out of curiosity, what year would this have been? Early 90s? Yeah, early nineties. Like early I, nine. I, I, like I, yeah, like a, something like a ninety three or something like that. Something like that. Yes. Was Angus and Imben's local average treatment effect paper sort of making the rounds around the world, where you would have seen it? A little bit. I, I, it was not so, um, you know, well known. I remember, like, a, at some point in one of the our econometrics courses, like we have like a little bit of material related to that, uh. And I remember at some point, I think it was uh, when when I was uh, there in the master program, like uh, Hido Inbens uh, went there and presented what paper, oh. uh, what we know, we, what we know now as the fish paper, uh -huh. uh, oh, yeah. on, uh, you know, the like a food paper. market paper, uh -huh. like he presented it there, and uh, um, but it was not a, uh, it was not as well known, well known as this as is now, the fish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so were you familiar with the potential outcomes model before, you know, when, while you were at the, at your getting your diploma, was that something they spoke about? Vaguely familiar. I mean, like, like we have uh, like a one or two lectures, like a, uh, uh, about that, like uh, by Manuel Alano. Okay. But, uh, but uh, most of the training econometrics was not related to that. Was not like that. what do you think? I'm just curious, you know, cause you're learning so much in, in graduate school in econometrics, you just, I always just kind of felt like it was just never ending. Did you have a, did you have any kind of reaction to when you started seeing this kind of causal framework expressed that way? Or was it just not so much? I think that the, my, probably my first, like a, um, you know, significant exposure to this was like a, my, the second year of my PhD, uh, a, you know, like a program here at MIT. Uh, then I was writing a second year paper with a, 
uh, with a, you know, like supervised by Josh Angrist. And like as part of that, he kind of, a, you know, asked me to read several papers, uh, you know, and that they were written in terms of potential outcomes and in particular the, the paper about the local average driven effects. And that was kind of like a, a big revelation for me because I have been, I was used to models with cost and coefficients and like a much less heterogeneity that they, and that these papers allowed. And, uh, you know, like I, you know, I thought there was like a lot of potential in that and, and something that, they, you know, a, a line of uh, thinking that attracted me kind of uh, immediately. You felt like you could imagine yourself doing, being really creative with that kind of notation that, you know, maybe not doing something else or it was just, you just saw, when you say you saw a lot of potential? Yeah, so uh, in fact, like when I, I started, like a, um, as I said, I was uh, writing a second year paper in, uh, in econometrics and uh, my supervisor was yours. And I started writing something about, I can barely remember. Like it was like a tensor regression model with instrumental variables, something like that. Mm. And and I went to yours and I said, like, uh, you know, like, would you like to be my supervisor to the, uh, for this? And I'm not sure he was thrilled about the topic, but he decided that uh, he will do it. And um, but that make us like uh, speak a lot about uh, like uh, you know put us put us in contact, and we were like talking a lot about different topics. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I mentioned to him that, um, you know, like uh, in my master thesis in Spain, in fact, it was like uh, I was working on a, a on a you know instrumental variable models for quantile regression. And he tells me, well, you know, like I'm, I'm doing the same. I am like uh, working on a paper that is like instrumental variable models uh, for quantile regression. And and then like uh, we decided to to join forces on this project. And this like a uh, and then, like uh, we kind of transform it, uh, we transform uh, it, transformed it into a kind of potential outcome types of uh, setting. Mm -hmm. What? Well, so I'm curious in the minds of an econometrician, um, when you sort of decide to move something into that potential outcomes notation, you know, is there a conversation that you sort of have in your head or with your co-author, and you say, "Well, this is a good opportunity for do it to." for to use the potential outcomes because if we do the potential outcomes then it'll really be better what what exactly happens that where a person would say yeah let's go that direction as opposed to not doing it because you don't always have to do it right no like uh, you don't always have to do it it's a, it depends in in many cases i mean there is not the only way to do things but it's a way that is quite natural especially if you want to allow for a large amounts of uh, heterogeneity potentially. Right. And something that, uh, you know, like uh, I learned that I could do in this uh, framework uh, quite easily that I couldn't do in the other framework was the following. Like in the in the quantum regression paper, as I said, like I have a paper looking at, uh, you know, quantum regression with instrumental variables. And I have like some parameter that we were estimating at the end. But, uh, you know, in fact, I have no not a very clear idea of how to interpret this parameter. This yeah. something that a uh, Victor Cheron who's got my colleague like uh, solved like some years after that. Yeah. I found that he solved some years after that. And in the potential outcomes framework, it was very, very clear how, how to interpret this parameter, right? As mm. a, you know, like uh, in terms of parameter of, uh, you know, quantum regressions for compliers. Right. And that's something that, uh, you know, like uh, also kind of grabbed uh, my attention immediately. Right. And, uh, and uh, so like, I, I, you know, in that, in that case, it, there was kind of a, you know, immediate way in which you know this framework would uh, would help you thinking about that particular problem yeah 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 um so that's a good place to transition so so when speaking about your cap awaiting uh project was was that in graduate school when you started working on that this all this work on compliance? that that is in graduate school yes is that your job market paper it's not your job market paper that right? is my job that is my job market paper oh that is your job market paper oh yeah. Well, can you tell me about the origin of that that project? For the sake of the listener, can you tell us what the sort of the elevator pitch is about that paper? Well, the origin, in fact, is in the uh, was in the quantile regression paper that I was talking about. Uh, like uh, uh, Hido and Josh have been working on that for a while, and they were like, in fact, like relatively close to that uh, to to that uh, result. Uh, and uh, we were thinking about, uh, and when we joined, uh, we, when we when I joined, we were thinking about, you know, how to like estimate this, um, you know, quantum regression for compliers, and in which way, you know, 
what type of a, you know, problem this quantum regression for compliance will solve in the population. And, uh, and you know, like, and that's where, you know, like uh, Kappa came in. And, uh, I, but, you know, like uh, after we solved this problem, like I was thinking about that and, and I thought like, look, uh, you know, this is something that uh, can be used for many other things. Like in fact, like every, you know, like every, um, you, you know, like uh, expectation that you could estimate for, you know, the entire population, you can estimate it for compliers using this, uh, this, uh, these kappas. And, uh, and uh, that kind of, uh, you know, like uh, motivated my job market paper. Mm, mm. So uh, what was the response? What was the response people had early on? It, it seems like it's becoming getting, I, I don't know the full history of it, but it, it feels like at least it's becoming uh, more common that I'm seeing it a lot, you know, enough that I'm having to study it. Uh, you know, wh what was the original reaction to it? I think, I think that the original reaction was positive. I, uh, you know, it was this, uh, this, um, you know, issue that was like, a, you know, we have um, this uh, uh, local average to mean effect type of, uh, of a result that you, we can estimate uh, this, uh, you know, average to mean effect for compliers, but this group of compliers by itself is not a, is not identified. And how, you know, special this result is, and then what the, the Kappa result tells you that basically this is like, you cannot identify who is a compliant and who is not individually, but this is a group of the population for which everything is identified. You can run regressions for them. You can run like a, I don't know, maximum likelihood for them. You can run quanta, quanta regressions for them. And and then, you know, that was kind of a, I think a, in my mind at least was a neat, a neat result. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I think that lately, like people has been using like more and more also to, um, you know, describe, uh, uh, you know, like this population of compliers, because as, as I yeah. said before, you don't know who is a compliant and who is not, but you can say, what is the distribution of earnings for compliers? And that's, you can estimate. Yeah. And, and uh, so like, um, uh, it's a useful tool in my mind to, you know, like, uh, if you're interested in, uh, you know, like, uh, um, you know, like, uh, uh, estimating a local average stream in effect, you can also like uh, describe for, you know, what type of population you're estimating this. Yeah. seems really, it seems really interesting. I, I wouldn't have thought, um, I wouldn't have thought that I've, all, I guess I always thought the compliers were not, not fictional, but you know, they were just sort of, it was just, it bordered on metaphorical. I mean, I, I didn't know how to, you know, what I, I, I never just thought you could find them, you know, but like, uh, the idea that you could recover some of their characteristics was, uh, uh, is just so interesting. Um, uh, so, so you get your job market paper and, yeah. um, then you go to Harvard, Harvard Kennedy school. The Harvard Kennedy school. Yes. Right. So what happens next? Do you end up working on synthetic control? When do you start working on synthetic control? Well, I didn't start group? working on on synthetic controls immediately, like that was not a type of, a, uh, you know, like a methodological idea that I have in mind, but, uh, you know, as I, as we, we, we have uh, covered before, I was, a, I am from the Basque country in Spain, and uh, at the time there was a terrorist conflict there, and I was, uh, you know, very, uh, like, a, like, I mean, intensely, intensively interested in, in, in that, in, and, and, um, and, uh, you know, I was also like uh, wondering, you know, what was the economic effect of uh, this terrorist conflict, you know, on the economy in the Basque country. Yeah. And I, I started thinking about writing a paper about that. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I, you know, like I have not started yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, like at some point I went uh, back to Spain to give a course in, in the University of Basque country. And then... There is when I met uh, Javier Garzabal, and we started talking about this, and he had like similar interest, and uh, you know we decided to join forces and uh, and and write this paper. Mm -hmm. And at the point, at, at that point, you know, like we wanted to think about, okay, so this is the how the Basque country, the the economy in the Basque country evolved with terrorism. Uh, we need the counterfactual, but there is no there is no other region in Spain that really looks like the Basque country. And uh, then we think, oh, okay, perhaps you can like uh, mix a match, and and uh, so that, that that was kind kind of the origin. And I still remember the time that I was in my office at the Kennedy School, and and 
you know, what is probably figure one or figure two of that paper, you know, yeah. show up in my computer after, um, uh, you know, like um, the computation. Yeah. And I see, I think we have a paper there. <laughs> yeah. Like okay, this looks, this looks like we have a paper. <laughs> and uh, so that, uh, the, so the, the, the origin of this problem was like purely empirical. I mean, well, that right. was purely empirical paper, but uh, we didn't have a good way to do it. So we have to figure out something. Right. And um. So and then, of course, it was applied to many other things. How come, how come, what, what made you say we don't want to do a difference in differences off of this one treated unit uh, using the rest of the, the country? I'm sure that conversation came up, but but you, one of you said that's not the appropriate way to do it. Well, can you walk me through that conversation? Well, there are like several things here. First is that there is no other, you know, like a unit that is looks very similar to those country, any other region in Spain that it looks very similar to those country. The other thing is that we were we are using like a aggregate data, like a GDP per capita at the regional level, and we have only one treated unit. Right. So like a, it is very difficult to run a regression and uh, you know with that type of um yeah. that type of information, right? And uh, so like we we needed to 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 create something uh, something new for that. Is when you when you're faced with a challenge like that, and you're like the the challenge is going to be we're going to have to make something new. Is that is that when you get sort of excited? Uh, I think I get more excited when I have the solution. When, you have the, when solution. the solution comes and it's something that you think that you know, like it is something that um, is going to work. Yeah, that's that's a good day. Yeah, in your life. But so doing this, doing it the way you did it, you know, when you said, all right, here's what we're going to do. The objective function is going to be, you know, minimize these characteristics between the two groups. And, but we're going to set the weights to be non-negative sum to one. What, what, yeah. walk me through why'd you, why, cause I guess you could have done it other ways. You know, you could have, you could have, mm. you know, there's probably a lot of ways to, I mean, there's a guy at Google that has his, his, his version of it that's very different. And so what was it about all those pieces that minimizing and uh, that the way you had those endogenous choices being donor pool weights what and, and them having those properties? I think this was, um, you know, I cannot recreate uh, um, with a lot of precision like uh, what happened in, uh, in my mind at the time, but uh, I think it was a uh, very much, um, um, you know, influenced by the literature on like a difference in difference and comparative case studies, things like uh, the Mario Boat Leaves or, you know, like New Jersey and Pennsylvania of Karen Kruger. And there you have this kind of a similar structure, right? Like you have a treated unit, you're trying to find a unit that is untreated but have similar characteristics. So here is the, you know, minimized, uh, uh, you know, the, the discrepancy between the characteristics of the two units. Yeah. And also, like you think about this, like if, if you think about a something that the Maria both live and you know, like a car is looking at a what happens in Miami relative to four other, four, four other cities in the south of the United States. Mm -hmm. But this is at, at the end, like a, he he doesn't talk explicitly about this, but implicitly some type of weighted combination, right? These four other cities in the United yeah. States, and and these two pieces you can make them explicit in your analysis and use data. Uh, to choose like a, uh, you know, like a, to tell you about it, you know, how you are minimizing the, the discrepancy between these two type of units and what type of weights uh, you're using, like a, um, you're using for your, for your, for, uh, you know, like estimating your, the contrafactual of interest. Yeah. And, uh, so like you can do that in a data driven way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny when I, I, um, when I, when I teach the synth paper, I've been more increasingly really teaching a lot of the unconfoundedness stuff. I, I was sort of sk not skimming it, but I wasn't because of him having to rewrite the book. I I've like moved some things around and it's forced me to like build it from the bottom up. And, you know, the, um, the, your, your paper with Dr. Embens, the um, 96 and the 2011, I know I've told you how much I like these papers, the distance minimization uh, matching papers, the nearest neighbor, mm -hmm. they, they feel kind of similar, you know, it, it's like, um, you, I mean, I know it's like one to one or one to M matching, but it's like the objective function looks similar. It's like, you know, minimizing this, uh, aggregate discrepancy, which is the sum of a bunch of squared 
um, different gaps. And, uh, and then, you know, it's not exactly weighted, but then I was thinking this morning, uh, I was like, well, you know, each unit is get each unit that gets assigned is getting a weight of one and then everybody else getting a weight of zero. So it's not like you can't kind of tilt your head and sort of see it. And I guess I was just kind of curious, you know, like, is that, is that a coincidence? Are you sort of thinking and is there something in your head at the time where you sort of are kind of seeing things as having similarities and solving them in not the same way, but just sort of seeing connections that, you know, cause Matt, cause you, cause I mean, I, even your semi-parametric diff and diff, I, it, I might, I kind of want to return to all of it. They, they all sort of feel like an Abity family of projects in a way. Uh, that's possible. I mean, it's, it's clearly there is a connection there and you're, you're totally right. And, and, uh, you know, like in fact, in the paper with a hit about the matching, because, um, you know, we are matching with replacement, like different units have like a different weights. Like you may have a unit that is used a lot mm -hmm. as a, as a comparison and some other units are not used at all. Mm -hmm. So like different units, they may have the different weights there. And in some you know, in some way, I guess that every time that you're trying to reproduce a counterfactual and there's something like a selection of observables, you're doing this type of a way in business in, in, in one way or another, like it's, right. a, like a, it's a change of measure. Right. Uh, the difference, I, I guess there are two differences uh, like uh, with, uh, in terms um, of this literature and synthetic controls. Um, one of the differences is that, um, you know, synthetic controls tries to take in to take advantage of a lot of co-movement that we observe in the data. We observe like some units really, you know, dance always like at the same tune, right? Like they kind of commute very much, uh, co-move very much. And, yeah. and, you know, synthetic controls is trying to, is trying to take advantage of that uh, for, for estimation of treatment effects. The other thing that comes to mind is like a, Synthetic controls tend to be, although they don't have to be, but uh, nowadays, like people have made many, many versions of synthetic controls, but at least, at least or, originally they tend to be about, you know, big aggregate interventions, right? Yeah. And uh, and um, and that's a part also that uh, kind of excited me a lot because we, we have a lot of methods that they, uh, you know, work for kind of micro 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 interventions, right? Like like the matching type of methods that you were talking about is like we have like two you know, is a treated and non-treated, and we are going to use like a, this large number of treated units uh, to try to see what will have happened to the non-treated and the treatment, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, like a, that is great, and we we know very well how to do that. But then uh, at the same time, many of the interventions that we care about, they are, they are not like that. They are macro intervention. They happen at the level of a, you know, like a state or a, you know, like a, the biggest school district or even a country, right? And then, and then we have much, uh, you know, we have much, uh, you know, like uh, not much machinery to, to deal with that yeah. type of uh, settings, uh, which, uh, you know, I, in my mind, they are they are quite interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what about these debates? You know, I, I feel like, you know, this, this is something that I feel like only people that have read your 2010 a thousand times, like me, start to kind of hear you these real subtle things like, you know, you sort of almost make almost kind of philosophical argument, at least that's how I take it about the superiority of um, avoiding extrapolation, the superiority of the non-negative weights that sum to one. And that's kind of how I've always read it is that, you know, that you sort of are making a little bit of a normative statement, which is that it would be worse if we were extrapolating and a lot of methods will extrapolate and synthetic control will force everything to be on the convex hull if it exists. But the newest papers, you know, that's the one thing where like, there's a whole branch of them. That's like, they all kind of are like, well, how can we relax that? And I just was wondering, you know, now that you, now that it's 2023 and it's, you know, been 20, it's like a 20 year anniversary now for the first paper, but what's your overall reaction to this, like that one little feature of synth, which is, you know, is it or is it not, in your opinion, normatively appropriate to allow the weights to be negative? And if so, how negative? And if not, how come? Uh, 
that's a great question. But I, I think I wouldn't I wouldn't say I I I, uh, I wouldn't say that it's like a normative um uh, 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 uh you know like it's a, a rule that they, you should always avoid extrapolation because sometimes there is no way to avoid extrapolation. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, however, that uh, there are people like uh, and some of these people in like these people include me in some cases in which they have some type they have some aversion. Uh, to extrapolation, they they you know they we get uh, like a special nervous where we're trying to like you know like a you know operating parts of the uh, uh, you know parts of the space of the variables where we don't have data, right? Okay, and uh, and um, you know like a, a problem with many of the um, estimators that we have in in econometrics is that we may be doing this type of extrapolations and that they uh, may rely a lot on you know functional form that we don't know much about and another you know specification choices and you know i am happy you know if people decide to do extrapolation but the problem is that many times is um it's not transparent how much extra right. uh, extrapolation we're doing mm -hmm. and if uh, you know like if if we are if we are in that business and and we are happy with uh, you know like extrapolating uh you know again to places where you may not have data and uh, and you know what a uh, you know what is the amount of extrapolation that you are doing? Like uh, yeah. I'm totally happy. I'm totally right. happy with that. I think right. that uh, like different people have different goals and different, uh, um, you know, like uh, different preferences. So I I wouldn't say that we don't we cannot do extrapolation. I think that we, you know even in some of my papers like uh, you know like we have proposed methods that uh, you know like uh, uh, take uh, take advantage of uh, extrapolation devices. But yeah. uh, I think that it's always good to, you know, to have a way to check how much of that we are doing because it's by by nature it's kind of a dangerous exercise. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's not and it's not that the interpolation biases do not exist. You also may have bias by interpolation, right? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you know, like and that also you should try to uh, figure out. Mm -hmm. that, right. Right. Yeah. I've seen you have a new paper on that too. Um, so. Uh, how did you first get introduced to Dr. Embens? What was it like working with him and learning from him? What's that relationship like? I think that the first time that I saw him, like if I remember correctly, is in this um in this um uh, seminar that I mentioned before that he gave at Tenfi mm -hmm. on the fish paper, and and uh, later I I you know like Manuel Alano and me and he like we have a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I was a master uh, student, and I did, you know, I didn't say much. Yeah. And and um, and then when uh, you know, like uh, again in like uh, my second year in my PhD, when I started working with uh, with uh, Josh on this paper on quantum regression, he had been working with Hido the paper. Mm -hmm. So like uh, uh, you know, by transitivity, like we became co-authors. Right. Uh, but at the time, I didn't see much of Hido. He was not uh, he was not around uh, like uh, very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we we ended up like uh, having this paper together, but uh, you know, like we mainly like um, you know interacted by by email, I guess. Yeah. And and uh, but then like uh, after I have graduated, like he came to MIT or to Harvard to give uh, to give a talk, and I I met with him, and he was starting like a, um like a writing the, the the book that he has with Don Rubin, and we were talking about a. Uh, you know the different, uh, the different, um, you know, like uh, topics that he was going to cover in the book, and we started to, uh, talking about matching and how to, you know, how it was going to show up in the book, and and we did agree that there was not much theory about that, mm -hmm. so we decided that perhaps that was a good uh, project to, uh, to 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 think about and and to you know try to to fill that gap. Well, they uh, were doing propensity score matching. So what, what was that? What was that was missing? This non-parametric matching? Well, propensity score matching. In fact, like there, either propensity score matching or matching on the covariate, there, there was no th no theory about oh, what no was theory. the sampling di distribution of that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So like what we have, we have a series of papers in which uh, we look at that in uh, you know what was the you know the large sample distribution of these matching estimators and also what at the end. You know what was the large sample distribution of uh, estimators that are like uh, do matching on the estimated mm. propensity score? Yeah, yeah. Somebody told me there was it was a real your paper was a real paradigm shift because of the repeated, the the matching with replacement part that 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 was novel. Is that right? 
I'm not so totally sure that this is uh, this is novel. I think that uh, the um, um, you know it is easier to think about the variance uh, of an yeah. estimator of matching estimator when matching is a uh, without replacement. Right. Uh, but the problem with that is that the uh, the, the thing that worries you when you do matching uh, um, is not the variance; it's the bias. Yeah. Uh, because the bias, uh, you know, doesn't go down like uh, as fast the the, the variance as. And if you want the bias to go down, mm -hmm. like, a, or to have a low, you know, low, probably lower bias, you want to match a with replacement and not match with a replacement. Right. You want to have always the best unit available for matching, right? Right. And that's why, that's why we adopted a, like a, like a matching with replacement in that paper. Uh, I cannot tell you, I don't know, honestly, uh, the history of matching with replacement versus matching with a replacement, but, but I doubt that it was new. I think probably people have done it before. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things in your, your JASA paper that always kind of struck me, and this because, uh, you know, this is always because I'm always like an, uh, an, e an eavesdropper in econometrics. I'm just kind of like reading and trying to learn from people, but not an econometrician. One of the things in your 2010 JASA is you're sort of kind of building the motivation for why the synthetic control model is valuable. And one of the things you say is, um, you say, well, well, you said something like, you know, the regression standard errors are based on sampling variance or sampling uncertainty. And that's not really the problem in this context because the we have aggregate data and uh, the uncertainty has to do with the counterfactual. And so then you motivate this randomization inference. Hmm. And it's it seems like, first of all, I had never heard that. That's just an aside, because that that was like, that's not really about synthetic control. That suddenly is about everything. Hmm. But especially as more and more admin data become available. But then the second point was, um, you know, echoes of that are in this these two new papers with Athey and Embens and Wooldridge, right? The, the, yep. the clustering. So I was just kind of curious... You know, is that true? Is that right that there's sort of a line that kind of is coming, or is it was it like this was sort of emerging, generally speaking? I, mean, I, I guess you could say it like all goes back to Fisher, but I was just thinking like there this seems like really novel and more recent. Yeah, I think that the, you know design based inference has been there like a uh, for a while, and uh, um, but uh, we have we have seen people using it in novel ways and in ways that they, you know, we didn't know before. Mm. And we have seen people realizing that, they, you know, depending on exactly what parameter you, you're trying to estimate, what type of data you have. And, you know, like a, you may want to like go with something like a design-based inference instead of sampling inference. In fact, in many cases, like a, in many in many cases in which you are you, you're running a synthetic control project, like a, there may not be a very well-defined sampling process. And if there is a sampling process, you don't know what it is. Or you may, you know, like observe all the units in the in the population. Right. And even if there is a sampling process, I may usually, like, because you say, because we have aggregate data, uh, you know, like the, the sampling uncertainty may be like a really small relative to other uncertainties that you have in mind about, you know, the quality of the, the control group and so on. Yeah. So basing like a like um our you know like a standard error so to speak or or, or our measure of uncertainty on that uh, uh you may, may be a little bit misleading. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so how did this project come about? How did the four of y'all get together? You're like the the Beatles now of like uh of econometricians. It's like the superstar team together. I will, I will take the Beatles. Like, I love the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, so, like, I think that uh, on the one hand, like, uh, Hido and I were, um, you know, like, uh, thinking of these type of issues and, uh, like, uh, Hido and, uh, you know, like, and, uh, and Jeff and Susan, like, uh, were also, like, um, Hido have been teaching, like, courses with Jeff and, uh, you know, like, they uh, oh, right. have been also talking about this type of stuff. And uh, like, and, and Susan was talking with Hido about this type of stuff. So like, we always just got together and and started like working on this. Mm -hmm. uh, we are like in different places. So like, it took a lot of, uh, you know, email and more recently Zoom, but uh, uh, you know, like it worked well. Yeah. So is it is it the kind of thing where you know, with like headers could ask 
heteroscedasticity robust, everybody's just like comma robust. Is that is that the future where we're just gonna go comma Beatles robust and it's just gonna be the the four of y'all? Or no, is it a lot more care has to be involved? I think there is a lot of more care involved. I think that the uh, something that the we say or or, or you know like a and I don't, I'm not sure now to which extent we are expressing that, but, you know, I think that the, it very much depends on the nature of the sampling process, the nature of the uh, assignment mechanism, exactly what is the parameter of interest, whether you have like a descriptive parameter of interest, a causal parameter of interest, you're interested in the sample, you're interested in the population, and in all these cases, kind of the standard errors, uh, like a change. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's the that's in quotes the bad news, which in my mind is not so bad, bad news. That you have to be careful about, you know, like what you are interested about, because different right. parameters can be measured with different precision. Yeah. The good news is that typically you can obtain standard errors that are much smaller than than you know, like if you go through the work of a you know, like specifying all that, what is the sample mechanism, what is the same mechanism, what is exactly the parameter that I'm trying to estimate, mm -hmm. uh, like a uh, you may 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 get uh, like a much more precise, uh, you know, like a measure of a you know uncertainty that you have before and mm -hmm. before typically was conservative. So there is something to gain. There is something to gain with that. Does it have a kind of randomization inference under the hood, or is it something totally different? Well, you know, like if in a, in a, when you're trying to estimate. So the, let me go back a little bit. If you if we are talking about the paper on clustering. Yeah. So the paper on clustering is uh, saying like if uh, if if you come to my office and uh, and you ask me like uh, should I cluster my standard errors and at what level you should cluster I uh, should I cluster my standard errors and you're thinking in uh, you know like a model in a superpopulation in which I may have like a random socks that are you know like a, at the state level or something like that and that's why I want to cluster. You know, as an econometrician, I don't have much to say. That's going to be kind of a that's going to be driven by you know how do you decide to model this uh, like a aggregate shocks right right and if they you have the aggregate shocks at the level of the state like you will have to cluster at the level of the states but mm -hmm. you have like a, the aggregate shocks and some other level like a i don't know patient age and and so on like a and like a then then you have we will have to do it in some other way but the problem for me is that uh, you know all these correlations like a uh, between like uh, outcomes you know i, I probably i can think that there are correlations in many, many different directions and many different dimensions. So what we say in this paper is that if, uh, but if, if you come to my office and say like, I want to estimate the effect of the treatment in, not in this uh, data genetic process, but in the population at hand, then like you, you know, like it only going to def depend on what is the parameter of interest, the sampling mechanism and the assignment mechanism, right? Mm. And uh, you know, that's, that's the three things, that's the three things that you, that you uh, have to the, um, you know, like a specify in order to get kind of the, the right formula. But I th I'm not sure if I am uh, answering your question because now, like, could you repeat what the, what the question was? Well, about? I Perhaps just I, was, I well, went because, on a tangent. Because I was thinking about the synthetic control uh, paper where you talk about this, you sort of allude, you don't call it design based uncertainty, but you sort of say that, you know, the standard errors in a regression are based on sampling uncertainty and and so then, you know, you, you, you have that conversation and then you lead into randomization inference to get an exact yeah. key value. And so I was just kind of wondering, you know, is that, is that sort of a part of the solution, you know, of using that kind of permutation inference or is it, you know, and if it's not, you know, I was just wondering, well, why, why, why was it then? And it's sort of not now. Well, what it is, I mean, like, a, a, I think, like, you, you say something about there is a randomization inference, a, a, you know, under the hood. Right. And there is something like that, because when you're trying to estimate, a, you know, like, a treatment effects, like, a, you will need some type of um, a knowledge about the same mechanism yeah. in order to estimate this treatment effect. Right. But uh, what the paper on clustering says is that, the, you know, like, this knowledge of the, like, this, what you need is this knowledge of a same mechanism is also going to be crucial to uh, to know how you have to do your inference, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, it goes, like, a, it has, like, two, these two, um, you know, implications. And um, and uh, so, like, what we are using is, like, a, there could be, there could be, like, a, perhaps not, like, a, 
uh, you know, like a, a explicit randomization, but you will have to have like some type of um, some type of restriction on the same mechanism to estimate the treatment effects. And once you have this restriction, you can use it for you can use it for inference. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, let me let me wrap this up, and I just want to end with with one thing. Is, is there anything else as we kind of conclude? And I just want to say it's always wonderful to to get to talk to you. Um, is there anything you'd like to share about the sort of the journey that you've been on as an economist and econometrician, your work or the future of the field that you just think would be, you know, uh, that, that you would like to share? Well, I can, perhaps I can tell you something that I, you know, I tell my, I, I tell my students, uh, especially the ones who are starting and uh, thinking about a, you know, like a, how to write their the dissertation is like um, we are we are incredibly lucky people. Like mm -hmm. we 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 kind of have the freedom to work in whatever we want to work, mm -hmm. and we are like surrounded by like a uh, interested interesting people, yeah. and uh, you know like uh, inspirational people, and um, and the thing that I would like to say about about a uh, you know my experience as, economist and, uh, as an economist and uh, this profession is that it's, it's a blessing. It's, it's great. It's great to do what we do every day. Uh, you know, I come here to my office, like I have wonderful colleagues, wonderful students. And, uh, you know, like, in, and the way to approach this is like, um, uh, keep always the excitement and, yeah. and, and uh, enthusiasm for doing like, a, don't make it a, you know, nine to five, uh, job. I don't have anything about against nine to five jobs, but you know, like make it something that you really care about because you're probably going to spend a lot of hours working on this more than nine to five. Right. And and you can do it like um, enjoying it better for you. I mean, that's that I can tell you that I enjoy this every day. That's great. Well, and I, I enjoy talking to you too. I well. enjoy talking to you too. I always and I love reading your papers too. Um, well, Same here. Uh, you're going to be doing a a workshop uh, on mixtape sessions in a, I guess in a couple of weeks, it'll be what late April it's in a couple of weeks. Yeah. You're okay. going to do it on. I will have to look at my calendar. Gonna... <laughs> That's right. I'll, I'll double check it, but you're going to do it on synthetic control and clustering. That's right. That's yeah. what we talk about, right? Yep. That's what we talked about. Good. All right. I'll, I'll tell people at the front about it, but it's definitely, I will say that when I heard you present um, at Northwestern, about 10 years ago, I thought it was the, it was definitely the best speaker of the seminar at the conference. And I just, it was one of the clear, clearest uh, lectures. It was just exciting. So I think anybody listening should come, but okay. Well, Dr. Abadie is, I mean, Alberto, it's so nice to see you as always. So nice to see you, Scott. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Gotta see you soon. Honey, you need me. Baby, I